So, here we are in the auspicious month of Kartik, Damodar. So I thought I would read, uh, translate for you very literally the Sanskrit from the Damodar prayer. It's a very beautiful prayer in Sanskrit. <clears throat> so the opening words are, um, are very beautiful. It begins simply, so quiet you hear a bomb drop. So, it begins Namami Ishwaram. Namami, of course, in Sanskrit simply means I bow. I bow. We sometimes translate it, I offer my humble obeisances. Literally, it means <clears throat> I bow. So, Namami Ishwaram, I bow to the Lord. That's how the song begins. I bow to the Lord. And then the Lord who is Satchitananda Rupam who has an eternal, blissful, all-knowing form. So it's very interesting, in the first line of this great song, um, practically all of our philosophy is there. By the word namami, I bow, we understand that... What's that? One more mic. So, by the word namami, namami ishwaram, I bow to the Lord, it's understood that the Lord is superior. I bow to the Lord, very simple. And that immediately establishes eternal relationship between the soul and God. Namami ishwaram, I bow to the Lord. And that Lord who is Satchitananda Rupa, who has a form. Actually, the word Rupa in Sanskrit means not only form, but also means an attractive form, a beautiful form. Whose form is Sat, eternal, Chit, conscious and Ananda, full of bliss. <clears throat> now, from here to the end of the second verse, from here to the end of the second verse, which ends bhakti vadham, all the words that end in the letter M, M is in mother, um, are actually objects of that first verb, namami. So for those of you who are grammar lovers, um, the verb here is namami, I bow, namami ishwaram, I bow to the Lord. And in Sanskrit, uh, often when a word is the object of a verb, the direct object, it ends in the letter M. And actually in English, in Indo-European language, we still have traces of that in English. For example, in English you have the word who, as in who goes there. But then if you use the word who as an object, then you can add the letter M, as in I'm speaking to whom. So putting the letter M at the end of the word who to indicate it's the object of the verb, of course, is simply Sanskrit. And that's why we add an M to the word Ishwara, Namam Ishwaram, I bow to the Lord. So all the words that come after that, ending in M, are all objects of that same verb, Namami. So I bow to the Lord, Rupam, who has the form, eternal, blissful, knowledgeable form, Lasat Kundalam, who has brilliant earrings, and Gokule Brajamana, who is moving about and shining in Gokula. And who Jashoda Bhyo, Jashoda Bhya, out of fear of Jashoda, Ulu Kalat, from the grinding mortar, Davamanam, running, because Krishna knew that his mother wanted to bind him to this grinding mortar. So he was Davamanam. Again, it ends in M, Davamanam. I bow to the Lord who is running from the mortar out of fear of Jashoda. Paramrishtam, but who was caught atyantato drutya, even though he was running so quickly, he was caught by the gopi, which here means Yashoda, gopya. 
It's interesting, the word atyantato, uh, every word is, I mean, Sanskrit is a very interesting language. Ati, ati means beyond, beyond. Just like the way they say transcendental in Bhagavad Gita, the way Krishna says it is atita guna, one who has literally gone beyond, ati ita, one who has gone beyond the gunas. So here, ati atyan, ati anta, Anta means end, the end or the limit. Just like if someone is unlimited, they are called ananta, limitless or infinite. And so here, ati anta means uh, beyond limit, which is sometimes translated in English like exceedingly, exceedingly. So and taha means simply in that way. So he was caught. By, by Gopya, by the Gopi, by Mother Yashoda, although running atyantato, running beyond limit, running very fast. So the next verse, Rudantam. No need for any formality here. So, Rudantam, of course, means crying. And again, this is the, simply the present participle in Sanskrit, crying, rudantam. And it ends in an M. This letter, rudantam, ends in M because it's still the object of the verb namami. I bow to the Lord who is crying. Rudantam mahur, repeatedly. Netra yugmam, rajantam. And um, rajantam means wiping his, literally his pair of eyes. The word yoga, as Prabhupada explains, means to link. Um, and so a pair is called yuga. It also has other means, of course. Uh, or yugma can mean two things that are linked. In other words, a pair. So netra yugma means his pair of eyes. In other words, his two eyes. So wiping his two eyes and crying. Wiping his two eyes, karam bhoja yugmena with his pair of lotus hands. That's poetic. He's wiping his pair of eyes with his pair of lotus hands. That's what it says literally. Rudantam muhur netra yugmam rajantam karam bhoja. Kara is an interesting word also. Um, kara literally means the doer or the maker and uh, therefore comes to mean the hand because the hand does everything. It's interesting, kara means the hand, it also means taxes. So kara means doing, therefore it means the hand, and the hand in Sanskrit means taxes. Sort of a sarcastic word, but that's the standard word for taxes. Kara, the hand, the hand of the government in your pocket. So, um, So Krishna is wiping his pair of eyes with his pair of lotus hands. Ambhoja means lotus. Ambas means water. Ja, born. Ja, we also have an English, like jana, janma. In Sanskrit, English, generate. Same word from Sanskrit. So generate is simply janana. All those words, janma, janana. Jantu and so on and so forth. Gente, gente in Latin means people, just like jantu in Sanskrit or jana. You can hear? If you can't take any more grammar and it's becoming too painful, raise your hand. If you like, it's too excruciating to hear all this grammar. So, Satanka Netram and his eyes. I bow to Krishna whose eyes are marked with that collyrium. So muhu shwasa kampa tri re kanka kanta stita graivam. Now there is a jumbo compound. And so that's all, whenever you see Sanskrit words that are connected by hyphens, it means it's a compound word in which only the last word of the compound is actually declined as a noun. So you have to figure out what it all means. So often, for some strange historical reason, 
to translate long Sanskrit compounds, you actually start at the right side and then go back to the left. You sort of go backwards and then you, we can understand it according to English syntax. Syntax means the word order. So what this compound actually says is that I bow to Damodar uh, Griva, griva means neck or throat, who has a griva, or like a stone, a jewel, stita, situated, kanta, on his neck, anka, that neck, which is marked, anka, trideka, by three lines, kampa, which are trembling, shwasa, by his breathing. Do you follow all that? So in other words, what that means is that it's a very poetic expression in Sanskrit. It means that Krishna is breathing heavily. He's breathing heavily because he's running from his mother. Because he's breathing heavily, his, he's shaking, which means he's shaking. He has three, three reka. He has three lines on his neck. So, that those, so those three lines are shaking on his neck, but on that neck is also a jewel. So anyway, it's, it's a beautiful poetic compound word. So that Damodar, who was Bhakti Vadham, was bound by love. And that, of course, is the whole theme of this Damodar Lila. It's actually in the second verse, this verse, that we first get the word Damodar. This is the Damodar Ashtaka, the eight verses to Lord Damodar. But his name is mentioned for the first time in the second stanza. Damodaram. And the theme of this Leela, the whole theme of this Leela is also given, which is that Damodar is Bhakti Vadha, bound by devotion. And of course, Mother Yashoda will be unable to bind Krishna simply according to the laws of nature, but she will have to bind him by her love. So that's the, the name Damodar and the theme of this pastime is introduced at the end of the second stanza. You following so far? Is that all clear? So then, iti drik swalila virananda kunde so gosham nima janta makya payantam. So, um, iti, thus. And actually, iti here, uh, iti thus, indicates that we are beginning, in a sense, a new grammatical structure. Because the first two verses. You basically just have a bunch of names of Krishna, Damodar ending in the letter M because they're all objects of the verb namami. I bow to Krishna who is this and that and who does this and that. And so then the word iti indicates grammatically that now we're going to sort of start a new sentence or start a new idea. And so idrik, iti idrik, iti idrik. A drik in Sanskrit comes from the verb drish which means to see, and so drik here means sort of to look like something. So idrik means it sort of, it looks like that. And it's translated uh, sort of being such a thing, having, looking like something or having that kind of appearance. So that's what idrik means. So iti idrik, uh, swalila here. Thus, with his pastimes which look like that or which have that appearance or have that nature. So, so thus, by, by such pastimes of his, Ananda Kunda, Kunda you know, like Radha Kunda, Sham Kunda. So Ananda Kunda, Ananda Kunde in, the, in a pool of ecstasy, in a pool, a reservoir of ecstasy, thus, by such pastimes, Sugosham, his own people, his own people, Sugosham. Just a little linguistic item, you may be interested in the word Gosha, is actually in, uh, related to the English word guest, like a person. But anyway, so Sugosham Nimajantam, thus drowning his own people, thus drowning his own community in a pool of bliss and doing so by such pastimes of his. And by doing all of that, Akyapayantam, 
kya uh, kya in sanskrit means to describe or to tell just to tell akya means sort of like to narrate to really explain something and akya payantam is the causative present participle of that verb meaning that um krishna is causing this sort of broadcasting he's causing this to be known he's causing this to be talked about everywhere that's literally what akyapayanta means to dh so akyapayantam and so what so by such pastimes of his he's drowning his own people his own people in this pool of ecstasy and by doing that he is announcing something he's declaring something to the world or actually causing the world to understand and and talk about this so what is it was it what is it he's broadcasting to the world by doing this that tadiyeshita geshu bhaktar jita tvam that he's broadcasting this or 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 causing this to be explained among a certain group of people krishna is causing something to be known among a particular group of people So what he is causing to be known what he wants to demonstrate by these pastimes is bhaktair jita tvam uh tvam here means something like the fact that the fact that so jita tvam is something like the fact that he is conquered the fact that he is conquered bhaktair by his devotees by the bhaktas so that's what krishna is broadcasting the fact that he is conquered by his devotees and among who is he disseminating broadcasting giving out this knowledge among what particular group is he is he announcing this specifically geshu among those who know ishita his position as lord tadiya just means his tadiya ishita his position isha means lord ishita means the position of lord or the status of lord so among people who only know his position as a lord among those people he is making it known that he is actually conquered by those who love him not simply those who respect him or revere him as the lord and he's doing that he's broadcasting that specific knowledge to that particular group of people by drowning his own people in a pool of ecstasy by such pastimes which have just been described in the previous two verses because when you get the word eti in sanskrit thus just like the english word thus tata it always refers back to something because you can't start by saying thus thus what thus introduces a conclusion to something you already talked about so in the third verse the word eti indicates that we're talking about the first two verses so eti drix velila virananda kunde so ghosham nimajanta makya payantam tadiyeshita geshu bhaktair jita tvang pun so then having done that punak again prematas prematas means out of love out of love that's what the tas means because of love or out of love again prematas tang him shata vritti hundreds of times it's interesting because avritti literally means like a rotation like to go around so it's 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 almost literally in sanskrit like saying 100 times around So it's just a way of saying times like 100 times literally 100 times around So uh a hun- you know hundreds of times one day I worship him out of love So that's the third verse Then the fourth verse uh varang deva moksham namokshavadhim va uh nachanyam vrineham varesha rapiha this is very interesting verse 
because it really, um, how should I put it, does all kinds of variations on a single Sanskrit word. The single Sanskrit word is the root ver, which means to choose. And just as in English, choice like, can also be an adjective. Like you can say, that was really a choice uh, piece of music, or that was really a choice book or something. So choice, because in Sanskrit, just like in English, the fact that you choose something means it has high quality. So choice can be a noun, a choice, but can also be an adjective, meaning high quality. And that's why an, exa exa an example of how it's used as an adjective is like Girivara, literally the choice mountain. In other words, Krishna, Girivara Dhari, Krishna is the lifter of the choice mountain in the sense that he's the lifter of the excellent mountain or the best mountain, the one that you choose above all others. So, keep that word, so then Krishna says, Varang Deva, not Krishna here, the, the author of this great song, Deva, O oh God, Varang Deva, Moksham, the Moksha Ava Dingva, why is the word Moksha used twice? Because he's saying, the author, that Nachanya, uh, Vraneham, Na Vraneham, I do not choose any choice. In other words, I do not wish for any wish. Just like in English, the word wish can be the verb, I wish, but it can also be the object of that verb. What do you wish for? You wish for your wishes. That's exactly the same thing in Sanskrit. So here the song is saying, Na Braneham, I do not wish for Varam, for any wish. O oh God, Na Moksha Va. Na Moksha, I do not wish for Moksha, for liberation, or anything up to Moksha. Moksha Vadim means, because Moksha is obviously like the big winner. You know, in, in the ordinary Hindu Vedic culture, the grand prize was moksha. If you read the Mahabharata, um, you see everybody wants this, but uh, that's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that I came because people forgot the real spiritual science. Yoga nashta parantapa. The actual spiritual science has been lost. So interestingly, when you read Mahabharata, and Mahabharata, even more than Ramayana, is kind of like the quintessential Vedic culture. For one thing, because it has a much larger geographic range than the Ramayana, that goes all over India. And even, I mean, Mahabharata means like Greater Bharat, just like Great Britain includes Northern Ireland and Scotland. So Great Bharata, like Great Britain, included places that are today of course, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and many other places. So Mahabharata, uh, because it really is a pan-Bharata story, it, it's about all of Bharata. Also, we hear about so many different kings and multiple incarnations of Krishna. Krishna comes as Krishna, he comes as Rama, Balaram. He brings so many of his pure devotees. It's a great story. It's, it, it goes on for many generations. The Mahabharata story actually begins <clears throat> at the... Uh, it actually begins, if you're interested, uh, in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam. Because in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam, uh, the devas and asuras engage in one of their most famous activities, churning the ocean of milk. Sura sura na udadhi matnatam mandarachalam. It's the Bhagavatam describes it. So, now, when they churn the ocean of milk, if you remember, uh, I think the demons kind of is... Well, no, they, they work together. Then when the milk came, the demons were going to take it. So Krishna came as Mohini Morti. And you know the rest. He came as Mohini Morti, stole the nectar, so to speak, from the demons, gave it to the devas. Now the demons did not simply roll over. 
If you read the sixth canto, that was the start of a great series of wars. Now, in that war, this is all in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam. In that war, uh, the demigods were actually winning, so the demon started cheating. And the way they cheated is they started using prohibited weapons. There were certain weapons that were con that were actually outlawed. You couldn't use them. And the demons started using those outlawed weapons. So at that point, Indra had to turn to Vishnu, and Vishnu came. Now, if you read the Bhagavatam carefully, what you find is that when Vishnu came, when he first appears riding on Garuda, he doesn't actually take sides. It's not that that Vishnu rides in and just starts mowing down the Asuras. He just shows up there and like, hey everybody. Now what happens at that point? Vishnu has actually not done anything against the demons. One of the demons is so hot-headed, so demonic, so out of control, that he rushes at Vishnu. He first throws his trident at Vishnu. And Vishnu just grabs it in midair. Don't try this, you could hurt yourself. He grabs the trident and he throws it back at this demon. The trident goes through the demon's body, goes through his lion mount, kills the lion too, and just goes right into the earth. So that thing was really thrown. Now that demon, that demon of course is none other than Kalanami. It's Kalanami. Another demon who was there, one of the leaders of the demons, but who didn't attack Vishnu at that point, was, um, oh my God. Um, this is not a senior moment. I'm just rusty. Uh, forgot the guy's name. But anyway, what happened is, if you actually read the Bhagavatam as a historian, start putting things together, uh, Viprachiti. Viprachita was his name. Now, Bali Maharaj was also on that battlefield. He did not attack Vishnu. Which is very... Now, if, if you look at what happened, at the demons at that point split up. This is not mentioned explicitly, but if you just read the Bhagavatam, it's obvious by what happens later. The demons actually split up. One side of the demons decided that we don't want to fight against Vishnu. That's not our goal to kill Vishnu. That was the group led by Bali. And he eventually does conquer Indra, but he does it, according to Kshatriya Dharma, of course, prompting another avatar, Vamana. That's another story. But there were other demons who decided that they did want to kill Vishnu. They did want to fight. They didn't want to play by Dharma. And so what did they do? Now, to understand what they did, you have to understand the nature of military insurgencies in general. Because what they planned is technically a military insurgency. An insurgency means a group that has lost control of the government, is not actually in power, uh, creates sort of a clandestine military force, and then attacks again. Now precisely because insurgencies are led by people who have lost power, and who cannot stand up against the full military might of the government, whatever it may be, they always tend to go to difficult places where ordinary armies can't go. For example, they go to deserts. Think of, you know, southern, uh, what do they call it? Um, oh my God, those two countries. Jad, not Jad, in Africa, North Africa. Anyway, they go to the desert, they go to the jungle, they go into the mountains, like in Chechnya. So if you look at like these guerrilla insurgencies, they always go somewhere where you can't bring a normal army. They go to the desert, they go to the jungle. So exactly in that sense, these demons decided that they were going to infiltrate and take over a remote, insignificant planet and turn that planet into a Death Star, if you know your Star Wars. They were going to turn this planet into a type of Death Star and then mount an insurgency against the demigods and Vishnu. The remote, out-of-the-way planet they chose where they could get away with this 
is, of course, the earth. And um, the, what they wanted to do, they thought they were being very clever, that the way to take over this planet without empowering the demigods, because they knew that power was in Dharma, is that they actually took it over legitimately. They took birth as the children, as the sons of the greatest kings of earth. And so therefore, without violating Dharma, they began to take over great kingdoms. Actually, if you don't mind, I'll, do you want to hear what actually happened? So, uh, if you actually read the Mahabharata carefully, the unabridged Mahabharata, Mahabharata and start putting the pieces together, this is a story that clearly emerges. For one thing, you have to go back several generations before Krishna to understand what actually happened and why the Bhagavatam 10th Canto begins by saying that Bhumi went to Brahma when the earth was overcome by demons disguised as kings. She doesn't mean, you know, kings that didn't belong to the Hare Krishna movement. What she actually means is aliens from other planets, Asuras from other planets that invaded the earth. The earth had actually been invaded by aliens. And um, so if you go back Krishna, and then Krishna's father is, of course, Vasudev, and then before him is Surasena, and then before him. So if you go back about five generations, according to the Mahabharata, five generations before Krishna, the leading kingdom in Bharat Varsha was not the Kuru kingdom. And Hastinapur, in fact, was not the world capital. It very clearly stated that the leading kingdom was Chedi. Chedi is roughly uh, around Jansi, where Prabhupada left, and, and then south of Jansi, that area is Chedi. Because king, there was, there was a prince named Vasu. If you study European history, or even Indian history, what you find is that often there aren't enough kingdoms to go around. Kings have lots of sons, and there are not enough kingdoms to go around, so you get all these sort of unemployed princes. Which is, by the way, one of the main reasons they started the Crusades. It was a way to get all these crazy juvenile delinquent princes out of Europe. Anyway, so you have this... Now, another thing you have to understand to get the whole Mahabharata picture, and that is that the relationship between the Mahabharata events, the invasion of the Asuras, and the incarnation of Parashuram. Uh, the connection is very simple. When Lord Parashuram came, he killed all the Kshatriyas because they were rebellious. That was nice. The only problem is he killed all the Kshatriyas. And so, now what? There's no one to rule. So, um, there are all these Kshatriya women that wanted to get married. They wanted to get married, they wanted children, and there were no Kshatriyas. So they made an arrangement that, and plus someone had to govern. So they made an arrangement that these Kshatriyas, Kshatriya women, there are some uh, great philosophers that say women didn't have Varnas in Vedic culture, which is... not exactly right, since otherwise, how could you get Varna Sankara, which literally means Varna mixing. How can you mix Varnas if women don't have Varnas? I just thought I'd throw that out because there actually are people traveling around ISKCON saying that women don't have Varnas, which is absurd. Anyway, so the Kshatriyas, which is a feminine word for Kshatriya, um, they approached the most pure Brahmins. And with these Brahmins, they had children who were by Dharma and by agreement among all the leaders of the world, they were officially classified as Kshatriyas and they were considered to be eligible to again rule the world according to Dharma. Now, there was a very interesting, you could say, unintended consequence of this regeneration of the Kshatriya order. That you had all these kings of the world who were um, very Brahminical, because their fathers were all Brahmins. Plus, because Parashuram had killed all the bad guys, the Mahabharata says over and over again, the world entered a golden age. No one lied, no one cheated, no one stole, no one raped, no one killed. It was just like, so what did the, what did the Kshatriyas do? They had a lot of free time. So if you think about it, even Shantanu's father, even Shantanu's father, who was the great Kuru king, what was he doing? 
He was sitting on the bank of the Ganges just meditating. He had lots of free time. Well, what about stopping all the criminals? There aren't any. And so similarly, you have this King Vasu who just goes to meditate because he's got nothing to do. And he has no kingdom. Now, very inter interestingly, the Asuras chose this planet at that time to invade because they saw that the earth was basically defenseless. You know, they had sort of beaten their swords into plowshares. There was practically no violence going on. The kings were just all out practicing yoga, and there was no crime. There were no defenses. So it's precisely at that time they invaded. So, uh, anyway, this King Vasu was getting too powerful, and Indra began to worry that Vasu was going to take his position as Indra. So Indra knew that Vasu was too powerful. He can't just send the, um, you know, the girls. That's what Indra usually does, just send in the girls. And then the yogi falls down, and that's that. But Vasu was too powerful. So this is very interesting. Indra actually came himself. This is all in the Mahabharata. Indra it may not be in the comic books, but it's in the Mahabharata. Indra actually came himself and he said to Vasu, hey, let's talk, you know, let's have a gentleman's talk here. And he urged him that you don't try to be Indra now because you have work to do on the earth. And of course, Vasu's response must have been, what work? I haven't got a kingdom. So Indra said, I'm going to give you a kingdom and I will make it the most powerful kingdom in the world and it will, you will be the emperor of the world. The kingdom he gave him is Chedi. The kingdom he gave him is Chedi. And it's clearly said at that time, Chedi was the leading kingdom in the world. And the capital of Chedi was uh, Sukti Mati, which means sort of like Pearl River. There's a river there, Pearl River. So, so what did the demons do? Just to show you how they did things. The Asuras, now this King Vasu was so important He's called Uparicharu Vasu. Uparichara, which means literally upwardly mobile Vasu. Because <laughs> that's what the name means. Because Indra also gave him this crystal airship. So he was Uparichara, upwardly mobile Vasu. And he is the... But what happened is this most powerful kingdom, an empire which was specifically empowered by Indra, to protect the world against the Asuras. And so what did the Asuras do? They took birth in that very dynasty. They actually took over the very dynasty that was meant to stop them. Because one of the biggest demons, Asuras, Viprachiti, took birth in the Chedi dynasty as Jarasandha. So it's at that point, in my calculation, that Bhumi had no choice but to go to Narayan, because Indra's plan, like, okay, I'm going to empower King Vasu, you'll become a super king and emperor, but then the Asuras simply take birth in that very family. So you have this interesting situation where King Vasu is the, is the grandfather of both Jarasandha and Vyastev. Jarasandha and Vyastev are both grandsons of the same person. Anyway, that's Mahabharata. So I'll just finish up the Damodar, but I'm working on that. As you can see, there, there's a lot there if you actually go in and dig it out. There's a lot going on there. So, uh, anyway, so Lord, the author of this song says, I do not wish for the wish of liberation, nor anything up to liberation, anything leading up to liberation, which means everything else. Uh, even though you are the Lord of wishes, Varesha, I do not wish for a wish from you even though you are the Lord of wishes, Varesha. In other words, you can give anything. So that's what's going on here in this verse. Rather, idam teva purnat, this body of yours, my Lord, idam teva purnat, gopala balam, is a coward boy. Let it always be manifest in my mind. What is the use of other 
bones. Just let this body of yours, the cowherd boy, always be in my mind. Anyway, so I translated half of it for you. So any questions on these points? <laughs>